question, what is the building block of society? What would you say? So, you got to put on your philosophical hat, I guess, for a second. So, we're going to go deeper. What is the building block of society? Um, of course, there's no right answer. There are lots of answers. People have debated about this for years and centuries and come up with all kinds of different ideas about what is that thing that forms the foundation or is the solid thing underneath all of society being built on it. So, you know, some people have said, oh, it's faith. When people are unified in a single faith, that faith feeds that society and it's good. Or people said education, you know, is the foundation or the bedrock of society. And once people are educated, then society works. Or people said, you know, strong government, that is the way to build a strong, good society. Once the government is structured and cares for the needs of people, then society is good. So, what is the building block of society? Uh, turn to somebody or two people around you and tell them or ask them, what is the building block of society? All right, have we resolved the many year long struggle to figure out what is the main building block underneath society? I'm sure we have. Um, so, a couple answers. What, what kinds of building blocks did you come up with? Anything revolutionary? Anything different? Ethics. Ethics. Yeah, morality, ethics, building block of society. Yeah. Unity. Unity. When we're all together, things work. Love. Okay. Love. Love. Hey, that's kind of a good one. Love. Yeah, that's almost as, as good as Jesus. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right. Common language. Common language. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's that? Common interest. Common interest. Yeah, kind of like unity. But yeah. For sure. Sorry, what you say? Faith. Faith is a huge building block of society. What? Law. Yeah, right, wrong, the way to go. For sure. So, uh, one answer that has not come up, uh, which is interesting because a lot of cultures and a lot of writers throughout history have come up with this as the building block of society. Uh, in ancient Ireland, they, they said, we have arrived at the conclusion that the family unit was inevitably one of the essential building blocks of society. Uh, this history of Islamic society said family and lineage continue to be the building blocks of society. And in Egypt and the Egyptians, writing regarding that, said the same thing. And ancient Rome, the Roman family household, was the building block of society. In the world in which Jesus lived, Family or household was the beginning or the building block of society. And when they talked about family, they used a different kind of word or a different kind of understanding of what family was. You know, we think of family as, you know, the dad, the mom, the kids. Those who live in that house, and it's the nuclear family. They didn't call it that. They saw it as something bigger than that. They saw family as more than just those people. And so what they called it was a household. And a household involved um, a father figure, which is usually a father, um, and involved a, a, a wife, and involved kids, but it also involved all these other people. It involved slaves who did the work on their land uh, or did things for them. It involved adopted people that they had brought into their household uh, it included extended relatives. So it included kind of this network of the closest relationships that you would have with people. So your family was not mom, dad, kids. Your family was this network of close relationships. So for the sake of today, we can call it our kin. So your kin was not just two generations. It was this group of people that were in your household. And this whole idea of, of household extended throughout the entire world in which you know, Jesus lived and Paul wrote and the New Testament was written in, it, it, was, it was everywhere. So the Roman emperors, for example, the Caesars, they saw their role as the father figure to the household of Rome. So the entire empire was their household. And they believed that they were the ones who were in charge and everybody else was responsible to obey them and to do what they said. And if that happened, 
That was how their society worked well. It trickled down to cities also, where cities had leaders, they had local governors or local city rulers who would lead, and all of the people within their city were like their household. And as long as those people obeyed their leader, and they all got along, and the authority structure worked, then society in that city worked. Of course, it then trickled down to the household, where the household was that basic unit, and when those relationships worked in the right way, then that family or household worked. And people believed that each individual household was a necessary building block that when all structured together and all built in the right way, that built the perfect society. So for them, family and household and those kinds of things built the perfect society. It meant a few things, though, for this to happen correctly. And the way that they understood, and we've got to get this down to really understand, I think, more and more out of this passage that we're going to read. We have to understand that the way that they saw this all working out, and the way that they saw this family household unit being the building block of society, certain things had to work. One of which was everybody had to obey the patriarch, or the father figure in the household. Um, the father figure was responsible for everybody in the household and took that seriously, or should have taken that seriously. And consequently, everybody had to obey the father figure. So the spouse had to, the kids had to, the slaves had to, the extended family had to. The father figure, the patriarch, whoever, was in charge. And so that authority structure had to work. So the kids had to be willing to obey, the slaves had to be willing to obey. Everybody had to be willing to obey that kind of figure. Um, there were also the slaves. And the slaves were unlike our American kind of slave trade, or what we think of it as, which was more brutal and uh, inhumane in a lot of ways, and racially tied. This was people doing work within a household for the purpose of uh, being provided for. So for the most part, slaves were not treated poorly. They were actually treated like family members, but they just did work and were allowed to live there as compensation for their work. So that's kind of the background of the slaves, and so when we read slaves, we kind of think, whoa, that's American. No, it's, it's in this family household unit of obedience and structure and good relationships for the purpose. That, that's what it looks like. We've been talking about shifts the last number of weeks that God has made, that there's this collection of these shifts in the books of, book of Colossians. And when we've looked at these shifts, we've seen that God has made some major shifts that then cause us to look at major shifts in our lives for how we act, for how we believe, for how we behave, for who we become. So they're the shifts that God has made that then impact shifts in our own lives and things that we might be able to do. It was in this world of this kin, household, building block kind of society that God shifted. And the shift that God made is the major shift that's behind the entire book of Colossians. It's probably the major shift that's behind everything. And it's simply the shift that God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus into this world and into this situation and into this society that was different from ours, but it was the society that they were in. And the shift that God made is God sent Jesus there. But when Paul writes Colossians, remember Paul isn't so concerned that God just did that. He's concerned with what that meant and the change that that brought. Because it wasn't just that God sent some guy into the world, into that culture. It's that God sent Jesus to be Lord in that culture. So God sent Jesus to be master. God sent Jesus to be savior. God sent Jesus to be guide and friend and uh, son of God and God himself. God sent Jesus to be Lord in that culture. So it wasn't just that... Jesus is Lord, it's also even, how far does that reach? How far do we go with the fact that Jesus is Lord? And this is what Paul says about it. Specifically in, in one verse, he says, Whatever you do or say, do it as a re representative of the Lord Jesus. So if that's the case, if he says everything we do, we do it as a representative of the Lord that God sent, the shift that God made. If that's the case, then how far do we take this whole idea that Jesus is Lord? Do we just take it to mean we live in certain ways and act in certain ways on Sunday mornings when we're at church? Do we 
take that to mean we live in certain ways and believe certain things on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, or when we're around certain people, or when we're doing certain things and not other things. I mean, if Paul had anything to say about it, if we really are serious about that verse, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, then I think he means we have to take that all away. That Jesus is Lord in everything. And what's crazy is Paul kind of takes a step back in this passage that Jean Marie read, the kids looked at, we're going to look at. Paul almost takes a step back and says, I'm going to look at my world, the world that I live in, this world where this household structure exists, and I'm going to look at that and say, if Jesus is Lord of this, then what do I do with it? How do I respond to the household structure that I'm in? How do those relationships work? And is Jesus Lord of this? And if so, what does that mean that we have to do? Um, since we're calling this structure the kin, or the kin structure, we're going to call this shift uh, the kin shift. Thank you. I appreciate that. So this is the last one you have to help me with. Okay. So this is really our kin. It's the shift that happens when we look at our kin, our, our closest relationships to us. And they're not just family. This can be close friends. This can be people that we're heavily invested in. What does it mean to live in those relationships with the people that we're closest to? Um, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we handed out these kind of cartoonish sorts of things that um, summarize the book of Colossians. And it's kind of a fun but a neat way of looking at the book and also seeing the breakdown of how the different sections in the book work. I know this is kind of overwhelming and kind of crazy and you can't see all the details. But in that circle is the section we're looking at today. If we zoom in on that circle, this is what it looks like. And so we, this is the picture of Colossians. Oh, originally, there was a patriarch in the Roman world, and that's how the kin, the household, worked. But then Jesus died on the cross and came, and then it changed. It shifted. And Jesus is Lord of the house. And if Jesus is Lord of the house, Paul asks, what do we do? Now, my favorite part of this cartoon is the guy standing in the lower right corner. He's like the little staunch Roman dude. And he's looking at this Jesus as Lord of the house, and he's saying, weirdos. <laughs> and I think people probably looked at it that way. You know, people looked at this Jesus as Lord of the house and said, are you kidding? Yeah, that's weird. Because that's not how things work. So Paul's shifting in a big way when it comes to these closest relationships that we have. So we're going to look at this. And uh, this is how Paul describes these relationships that we are closest to. And he gives some specific instructions, um, but we're going to look for something a little bit bigger than the, just the specific instructions. So here's the passage, and then we'll look at the shifts that Paul raises. So he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely, because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord, rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. So clearly Paul is giving some specific guidance and instruction in this whole situation. But what if we step back and kind of ask, well, what's the main theme? Or what's the big idea? Or what's Paul trying to get across? You know, not just saying, you do this, you do this, you do this. But what's behind that? What's the big theme that he's getting at when it comes to these closest relationships? Uh, so first, I want to look at the way that Paul instructs all of these people. You know, what are the ways that he tells them to act? So, verbs. He says things like submit and love and do not aggravate and obey and please and work willingly and be just and fair. When you look at those words, 
What kind of feeling do you get? I mean, do you get like an amped up feeling? Do you get a calm down feeling? Um, I, I think of uh, the uh, the celebrity chef uh, a couple years ago that was all Bob and Emerald Lagasse, and you know he would throw the spice in the pan and he'd say, um, "Bam!" and and uh, he'd say, "Kick it up a notch." And we're going to kick it up a notch. I don't think Paul is kicking it up a notch. I mean, when he's saying, "Be willing," you know, "Obey," "Submit," "Love," "Don't aggravate." I mean, it's almost like he's saying. You know, let's be serious here, but let's just calm down a little bit. He seems to be trying to calm everybody down. In a world, and in his world, where the kinship relationships, for the most part, were all about power, they were all about somebody who's in charge and everybody else had to obey, and you can be sure that there were power struggles going on, Paul's saying, don't fight like that. Don't be so aggravated at each other, submit and love and obey and be willing, he's doing something different. And I love how brilliant it is that he does this, because it, if we look at the people that he mentions in the passage, I mean, he starts with wives and then husbands, and then children and then parents, and then slaves and then masters. He's taking the pairs in these relationships. You know, the wives, husbands, children, parents, slaves, masters. And at least... In, in their structure, he was starting with the less powerful and going to the more in charge. Um, you know, they, they saw it that way. You know, the children are not in charge. The parents are. The slaves are not in charge. The masters are. The wives were not in charge. The husbands were. So he's starting with the ones that weren't in charge. And then he goes to the ones who are in charge. And you would have expected, everybody would have expected him to start with the people who were not in charge and say to them, hey, calm down. Don't get into a power struggle because you're not in charge. But then what does he do? He says, hold on, but the people who are in charge, you're not off the hook. The people who are in charge, you need to do this and do this and calm down and not aggravate and, and be willing. And obey. I mean, he, you need to do these things too. So it's like Paul is shifting in all of them and what we could call this is this is the shift of diminishing dominance. Because what he's doing is he's saying, everybody, relax. Diminish your dominance. Don't try to dominate. The people who are in charge, don't dominate. The people who aren't in charge, you don't fight back and try to dominate. He said, this is not about domination. Because if we're serious that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is Lord of even this, our closest relationships, we can't dominate. After all, if we're following Jesus faithfully and we're trying to do what Jesus did, you know, do everything as a representative of the Lord Jesus, if we're faithfully doing that, did Jesus dominate? No. I mean, no, he hung on a cross and he was called the epitome of humility. He did not dominate. We can't dominate the closest of relationships that we have. It was a problem in Paul's world, and it's a huge problem in our world. I mean, what do, what do we most often say? Uh, maybe not you and me, because that would be bad. What does everybody else often say about the relationships that we have in our lives? You know, what am I getting out of this relationship? I'm not getting enough out of this relationship. Well, it's, the relationships aren't about us. I mean, if God gave us the relationships, they're, the, they're more than just about us. It's about what God wants to do in us. And so our place is not to dominate. Whether it's the white husband, the child parent, the slave master, the employee employer, the teacher student. I mean, you pick the relationship that's, that we're close to. Our job is not to dominate. So Paul says something else. Uh, he, in this entire section, and kind of over and over, he repeats something else that seems to be the grounding, or the, or the undergirding, or underneath all this, all this stuff. Um, he says the same thing kind of over and over. I mean, uh, I know you saw it. I saw kind of some affirmations of it as we read the passage. He says things like, "Do this for this pleases the Lord," or "Do this because of your reverent fear of the Lord." Or do this as though you were working for the Lord. Or do this because the master you were serving is Christ. Or do this realizing that you have a master in heaven. 
I mean, it's good and right to do these things not because we owe our best relationships something or because they've been really good to us or because it's just like the right thing to do. We submit and we love and we are willing and uh, we don't aggravate and we do all these things because Jesus is Lord and because Jesus is Lord of everything. I mean, our standard is Jesus. Our standard for leadership, our standard for submission in all the different relationships we have, our standard is Jesus. And so our job not only is not to dominate, but our standard is to see these relationships as things that are completely and thoroughly infused with Jesus as Lord of those relationships. Whether or not the other party in the relationship is seeing that, our job is to see that as followers of Christ. Because if Jesus is our standard, then there's always room for us to grow. There's always room for us to love more. There's always room for us to do more if Jesus is our standard. This is called the shift, not of diminishing dominance, but this is called the shift of increasing reverence. Where if we see the relationship seriously as something that Jesus has given and we are being faithful in that relationship to be able to do everything out of reverence for Christ, then our job is to increasingly be reverent. If Jesus really is Lord of these relationships, then our motivation can't be domination. Our motivation needs to be reverence. You know, seeing the ways that God is leading us to work and to serve. Now, that doesn't mean that we just accept everything and you know, get walked over if it's a tough relationship. It doesn't mean that we just blindly accept whatever happens, but it means we earnestly seek. We earnestly seek to grow and understand who is God making us to be in this relationship. It's reverence. Uh, these past uh, six weeks, as we've looked through these shifts, I've, I've noticed something uh, that I didn't necessarily uh, see beforehand or plan on seeing, you know, as Paul was talking about all these different shifts, the shifts of our relationship with God, or the shift of how do we deal with hard situations, or the shift of how do we learn and grow, or the shift of being a disciple, and the other one, the shift of oh, being in a battle, in the battles that we face, and those tough, the, the battle with sin that we all face, the shifts that God...